Okay, right, you ready? Okay. So we've got a video for you today, and it's real going to be a real mix match of a whole load of stuff to basically look at what both me and Astrid, the psychic witch, think is going to happen in 2023. We're going to cover astrology, tarot, do some channeling, and just basically do all the chat that we do with each other all of the time, where we just try and decide what we think is going to happen. So yeah, this is Astrid. Hello, everybody. For those who don't know me, hi, I'm Astrid. For those who do know me already, you most likely have seen my face on one of my uh, online courses. So you are used to seeing my face for a prolonged of period of time. Good for you. So yeah, there, there's going to be just more of that. But this time you will also have another face to look at. <laughs> and that's Abby. Um, so yeah, um, me and Abby, when we always chatting, um, we always have so much fun. We always come up with so many ideas. And then we always sit like, oh my God, such perils of wisdom. We need to share this uh, with the world. It would be such a waste. So yeah, so that's why you're looking at this. And that's what we are going to do today. Yeah, great. So um, Astrid, yeah, because basically you really had the inspiration for a lot of this. So what was the first thing that made you think, look, we need to talk about this and then let's explore it from there? Because you know, uh, I really think we should do this thing and you messaged and we're just dead excited. So I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> um, I would say that it was the fact that I had multiple people actually messaging me already this year. And it kind of the things that they messaged me with kind of correlated with something I was feeling. And then I wrote about these feelings I was having to you and you've been like, oh my God, th this is exactly how I feel about things as well. So that made me realize like there is something going on this year. Like this year is like having quite strong energy, quite stored theme already that seems to be already showing, even though we are currently like mid-February, it already seems like it's already like the theme of this year is quite strongly set and people seem to be uh, noticing it quite strongly in their life. And I thought this is something that is, in this particular year seems to be quite unique. And I thought, well, this is something that seems to be worth talking about also because the energy theme seems to be a lot about transformation and setting things in motion. So I was thinking that especially in this type of a phase, people would especially look for some psychic advice, explanations of the cosmology of what's currently going on in their experience. So I was thinking that specifically in this case, we can be actually really useful. We're always really useful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, well, yes. But <laughs> yeah, no, totally. And I totally agree. Um, so what would, it, what would you say is the first sort of energy and how quickly into this year did you start to feel it? So how quickly did you feel it? And can you describe what you feel this energy is? Well, this year was manic. Like, it was almost like literally the first second of January. It just started like, and, I, and I'm correct. It was like that for you too, wasn't it? It was like yeah. really early on. And it, like, I always kind of feel the shift from year to year. But usually it's a bit more fluid, but this year it was like, bam. And it was just a, a first, second January, like hit by a train uh, type of a situation. It was very, for me, I, I experienced it as being like quite a brutal shift. Yeah. Wait, yeah, so I don't know if it was partially also by the fact, but, you know, 2020, 2021, during the COVID and stuff like that, that year, these years had kind of more like a cocoon, uh, stagnation, this wintry energy going to the roots and kind of like accumulating the power. So it was just maybe like, it was like a rubber band. It was like really ready to shoot. Yeah. So I think I think I, I felt the, sh the, the shoot. <laughs> yeah. Did you feel the shoot? Yeah, I did. And for me, I have to say, I did feel... I felt it a little bit well <laughs> just because last year was really intense I found the end of last year almost the last six months which then got highlighted even more the last three months I don't know it just sort of felt like um, I suppose the way I noticed it as difference was it wasn't so much the intensity because for me that intensity was already there but obviously depending on people's individual charts will depend anyway but then the specific energy that I kind of felt was coming in was um it's how would I describe it it's like, 
I feel like it's a mature energy. So even though we're coming out of like a Capricorn type of thing, I still felt like it's a real maturity, but a maturity to do with intensity and kind of like, I think leveling up a lot of stuff that you need to do. Because I'm guessing in a way maybe, you know, with all of like what you say, that co cocoon stage and the stagnation that's come out of that. I think like you say, the elastic band is so, so true. But I suppose I feel the elastic band in terms of a sense of maturity and responsibility about how to move forward with all the chrysalis of everything that's happened previously in whatever way that might have affected my life, if that kind of makes sense. So unfortunately for me, it feels like responsibility has just got catapulted into my life. <laughs> but I think that might be, this is what I wonder then with other people, if it's where they notice, not necessarily a specific energy that's the one that you described or I described, but more just kind of like, where do they feel that they're suddenly going to be pushed into this year? Because I feel it's a pushing energy, isn't it? Like whether you're ready or not, you have to go and you have to do this. And that's just the way it feels. And it almost feels like you're not ready for it. But technically that doesn't even matter because you have to go whether you're ready or not. And now I'm just getting an image and this sounds brutal and I don't think it is this, but like, um, and then, I don't mean to demean this from the past either, but it's kind of got that, you know, like running over the top of something where you don't know what's on the other side, but you know that you're not allowed to stay back down in the trenches. You just have to go over the top no matter what. So I also don't mean to trivialise that before because we don't have that sort of intensity, but in different levels to do with your soul's lessons or where you need to go. I think there's that sort of energy, if that kind of makes sense. No, totally, totally. Um, I also noticed that I think this specific beginning of the year seems to be fairly karmic. And I'm really getting that whatever people accumulated during this most stagnation phases of the uh, COVID period of the 2020, 2021, um, it seems like whatever they accumulated, how much like did they actually use that more winter-like time, the more cocoon stagnation time for really going deep into themselves I think the more they use that time wisely, the better results they are getting now. So the catapult energy seems to be better, keeps bringing better things for people who've really used that time to do some soul searching and going, um, removing obstacles, removing fears. It seems like now the catapulting energy is bringing them better stuff than the people who really resisted that. And even with that very cocoon phase, when there was like a like a glaring opportunity to really do some serious introspection. It was very clear that this is what this time is perfect for. Um, and they still resisted that. It seems like the catapult energy is not catapulting them to a good places right now. It seems like really, really very Saturnian, yeah. really, really Saturnian, very karmic. Like it seems like that's what's really determined what type of energy they are now getting into. But either way, it seems like it's, always have this like very movement push forward type of a type of a type of our energy which is very very fascinating and um i'm 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 finding it interesting because in a way that the whole you know the pandemic situation was something that kind of influenced the whole world not just people personally you know with their own personal lockdowns but it was something that was a very global and i think when you have something like this global cocoon-like time, I would expect that it's also going to bring a changes on the global level. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it's just a global stagnation is going to bring a global progress. And I think that one of the things like the, the AI, the artificial intelligence and all of that progress, we are now seeing technologically, obviously, was happening even before. The, it was kind of gathering momentum even before the pandemics, obviously. But I think... It just kind of a uh, created energetically a fertile ground for major um, technological developments this year, and I think that's something that's also going to happen. This catapulting energy also on like a technology technology level this year, very Aquarian. I was going to say, I was just about to say, and that then leads us into the whole movement with the Aquarius energy. So we all know the big, really big deal is Pluto is going to go into Aquarius this year. It will come out again for a little bit, but then it goes fully back in for around about 20 years. So we all know Pluto is that transformation planet, deep transformations. Aquarius is obviously one of the things it is. It's that whole kind of technology. It's kind of like science. It's innovation. It's also a lot of equality. So I can also see why this is going to bring up loads of things to do with equality in 
in all of the different streams that that kind of plays out in. Um, what do you sort of feel what's going to come with this whole Pluto and Aquarius? How would you interpret it? Like I, well, as you know, I have basically a Pluto on my ascendant. <laughs> so I'm um, like that Pluto is my favorite planet. I'm I'm 100% about Pluto. You can see the Plut Pluto in me in the intensity of my gaze. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm like I'm I'm 100% Pluto. That's my uh, so. <laughs> I I also see Pluto as like the intensity that has the power to change things in a major way, and um almost like the seed of the power. Um, even some people say that you know power is in a Jupiter, but in a way I actually more see it in Pluto than in Jupiter. But um. So it seems to me like with Pluto moving to Aquarius, we are really moving the seat of the power in technology and in a very like a futuristic concept. And with that, I would expect that it's within the upcoming years is also going to shift the necessarily a power structure within governments. Yeah. So I think like governments will obviously stay, they're not going anywhere, but I think we are already starting to see now that, well, who has, technically speaking, a big, like, also a huge power over human's life, apart from the government, well, obviously, uh, the technological giants like Google and all of these people and, and Facebook and, and Microsoft, and their decision impact us just as well, the decisions that are made by governments. So I think that with the Pluto um, in Aquarius, this will just continue in the direction of the power shift of the technology kind of being more bigger part of the more governmental structures and just kind of having that level of power that was previously only known to be, let's say, held by uh, nobles or, or, or governments. So I would say that it's really going to change the society in a major way. Uh, Somebody said that, like, right now we are basically on the crossroad between dystopia and utopia. <laughs> and it really, like, now we are starting to, like, like decide which way is it going to go. I am hope I'm going to be alive to see if, like, if this is going to be technological utopia or if I'm going to, like, you know, scavenge hunt for body parts like in Mad Max or some <laughs> stuff like that. Like, I don't, frankly, I don't mind either way. I think both of these options have its own charm. <laughs> <laughs> it says the person with Pluto on their ascendant. <laughs> exactly. What you expect, exactly. It's like, uh, uh, mm, the disappear doesn't sound that bad. It's, it definitely sounds more fun. But, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm fine either way. Technological utopia, dystopia, I'm fine either way. Like, but I'm, the, you know, I'm just a curious girl, so I would like to see where this is going. So, what do you think? Where is it going? Dystopia or utopia? <laughs> you know, I have this theory. I think people always sort of think it's just about to go one way or the other way. It doesn't even matter what year we looked at. Any year, twenty years ago, five years ago, two minutes ago. I think something about human consciousness is always like oh something's good and about to happen or something really bad's going to about to happen so part of me is always like ah you know i don't know where i sit with that yeah one. um but then um i really don't know on that <laughs> and that it would bring me into that the energy of aquarius as well which is the curveball and it is the wild card and i do really feel like it reminds me sometimes when um and I would even see this when I start predicting my own future and certain other people's futures. If they've got a lot of wild card energy in them and they're prone to like paradigm shift and jump and stuff unexpectedly, it becomes quite tricky to understand which way is that person actually going to go because they have so they have this I don't know wild card energy within them. And then obviously if you see their charts, they've probably got something really strong with like Aquarius energy or Uranus energy. And I know. Mm -hmm people come to me and I don't know if they come to you and they say oh well, this psychic said that they just couldn't see my future and this that and the other and actually I know I used to get that a lot 
you know, if ever there was a psychic whatever, they would be like, oh, I can't totally see what it is. And that used to always make me think, oh, what does this even mean? But now the more experience that I have with it, I think it is this wild card energy. And I think wild card energy is incredibly difficult to predict. It's almost like that gambling type energy. Do you know what I mean? It can go one way, or it can go the other way. And in that's tarot, the, that's the wheel of fortune in tarot, yeah. which I'm like speaking about cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, so, it, so I think that that's the sort of thing that could happen where it becomes really unpredictable. But yeah, you pull a card, see what you reckon the cards say it will be. Good or know. bad? <laughs> okay, so let me pull a few cards. Okay, so where are we are heading this year? Okay, first I'm going to pull a few cards for just this year in general, yeah. and then you know to find out like if this is going to go to your top or dystopia. Okay, this seems to be fairly positive. We have our six of swords, so just staying moving away from uh, from. Um, uh, unfitting or bad situation, which in this case would mean moving away from the COVID and all of that, the pandemics, moving towards something uh, better. So it's suggesting that um, we do have a lot of uh, positivity about movement forward this year. Lots of people might be having uh, feeling like, you know, that this is a positive shift as seeing leaving the negativity behind. We have a page of caps, which uh, together with Ace of Wands, which is suggesting um, new ideas, sparks of new creativity. So again, that's the push we've been kind of talking about, people having new ideas, starting new things, um, being willing to go on the new adventures, new sparks of creativity. Uh, we have a page of caps suggesting somebody being very excited about the new things. So it seems like in general, the moon here from the card is, a generic excitement about the new chapter, about the new things that are coming that would include uh, the new technological technological uh, development. Not, not surprisingly enough, the Wheel of Fortune, that's exactly the wild card we've been talking about, unexpected twists and turns of the destiny. So it seems like from the cards that we are starting with a lot of excitement and spark of creativity, but they may have to... The, the Wheel of Fortune, which is suggesting unexpected twists and turns of to destiny can kind of change that situation around. And I've turned out the devil, uh, suggesting some form of like a limitations being posed or hitting a wall with something or being entrapped in something. So with these cards, I would say this year might start with a lot of excitement, but then I would say throughout the year, something is just not going to go as expected and it might not turn out as positively or the way how people expect it with these uh, excitements, the way how it's supposed to be. But they are not necessarily cards that are suggesting that the situation would really on a physical manifest to both levels be bad. It more shows cards are pointing out some form of like a shift of consciousness. I would say throughout the year, maybe people will lose this uh, excitement that they have now about the new, new technology and new development. I would say they might run out of steam of that uh, page of cups. It's almost like childlike excitement. Mm -hmm. uh, that needs a lot of steam to keep up. And I would say people might not be able to keep it up throughout the year, especially uh, with the moon card, and then I got five of cups too. So mm -hmm. it seems that I would say the excitement might a little bit sour throughout the year. But as an advice, I got three of cups, which is sometimes seen as about not taking things too seriously, not falling for that negativity, not falling for the traps that the year, uh, emotionally not falling for the traps that the year will bring. So, yeah. Maybe good, good start, my sour throughout the year, but keep your spirit up. Yeah, totally. And you know, with that three of cups energy, because this reminds me of like the Uranus energy, which is the Aquarius energy in a way, is yeah. I think, you know, <clears throat> not taking things too seriously. It's this concept that if if a bit of wild card energy is going off, if things are completely unpredictable, if things can quickly shift from good to bad and bad to good, the only way to really go with that is I think you've got to get like a playful feel with it. You've got to not take it too seriously. You've got to be able yeah. to play with it. 
you've got to be able to find almost the excitement in the unpredictability and the twists and turns because this will mean that I think it will conserve your energy and it will mean that you're not going to invest heavily in something that just didn't go your way because the thing with this energy is the very next day something could be available to take you in an opportunity but if you're laying heavy or you're feeling in that entrapped energy of the devil you're not necessarily going to see that opportunity so I think it's like um this really fast paced energy that's coming in that we've got to understand how to work with it almost like snakes and ladders if you've ever played that you know one yeah. the dice and you're up to the top and another roll of the dice and you've slammed back to the bottom but you've kind of got to be okay with this kind of unpredictability and i guess it's like definitely with the devil card not holding on too tightly if you hold yeah, on 100 potentially you're going to miss the opportunity you've got to be like a ninja i feel you've got to be able to read your environment but also always expect the unexpected so you can have plan a b c and d but at the same time one of the other plans you have is that absolutely something like a total wild card can happen because even though you can never truly predict what a wild card will be if you're still prepared somewhere in your consciousness for a wild card if a wild card appears you're at least able to quickly switch into the mode of how to navigate such a type of experience and I kind of think this is something that's going to be important with that, you know, with what's going on. It would make sense because like, um, be, yeah, it's funny because like we've been talking about wild card and things can go either way very quickly. And then the cards kind of confirm that, yeah, really, that's really going to happen um, later this year. And I think that one of the things that also kind of wor foreshadowing it was the page of caps, because mm -hmm. I often use page of caps as somebody who is like almost childlike excited but yeah. sometimes it can almost be on the borderline of being a naive. Totally, 100%. And once you kind of got too wrapped up into the ideas that come with the, this, this, this page of cups excitement and almost naivety, then when things change very quickly, which in this case they might, because we really got that Aquarian Uranian energy going on, then obviously what will follow is you know, after high highs comes low lows. So I think, yeah, there was like a little bit of a warning, just maybe, you know, just don't go all the way up. So then you don't fall all the way down with this wild card energy, is just as you said, yeah. So, and that thing about the naivety, I think the thing to always remember is we've just done um, Saturn in Capricorn, and it's just about to obviously change into Saturn into Pisces. But the thing is, I think the thing is, wherever Saturn goes you're going to have to be mature and it helps you to level up and be mature and now I think like we said now you said in the very beginning if you've handled it well with sort of um doing all the incubation and everything that you needed to do with whatever was going off in your life I think you've learned or you've at least understood where it was you were lacking maturity so where it is you now must have maturity and if you take maturity in whatever area of your life it's relevant to into this year I've got a feeling that for many people that's going to almost be like um uh the baby trap basically would be not to hold that maturity in that area that you've been trained to be mature over the last few years and then also I feel like the golden cop would be if an opportunity or a difficulty arises that's how you get over it that's how you navigate it by once again bringing in that maturity that Saturn and uh, Capricorn taught you in whatever area of your life that was this is a good topic for the runes so uh, we've been we've been talking about just like you know throwing the tools um in so psychic circus so i'm getting my my own um runes because i think this is like such a great topic about the maturity so i'm just going to pull a few runes on like an advice from runes on the topic of maturity this year and like how to handle it and what the cards are saying um, okay, so we have Sovilo, that's not surprising, and um, Algis, that's very surprising. Okay, so we have a Sovilo, which is the sun rune, and we have a Algis, which is the protection or um, almost like a shield protection rune. So these two runes are telling me that basically the maturity in this particular year is going to have a two main function so that will really help you one is the sovilo is the sun which means resolving of the problems you will re this maturity this year will help you to resolve your problems and get you out of trouble and get you out of the situations so it's telling me 
where the tarot card has been more like um, warning against overly like childlike excitement, even though they express that, yeah, well, it might be very tempting to go that route. The runes are suggesting, well, it's going to be the majority who, is, who will actually get you out of the problems that you are getting. Uh, sun rune, resolving of a problems, resolving of a negative situation. So then we have uh, Argus, which is a rune of protection or rune of shield, suggesting that your maturity will also act as a shield in a situation, house, saving you and protecting you from situations that might that might arise and be negative. So it seems like um, even though it might be tempting not to be very mature <laughs> uh, this year, it seems like it's going to be um, very important component to avoid the the the, the shifts um, uh, the shifts of this of this year. So I would say in this case, maturity doesn't really seem like an option. It more feels like a necessity. Yeah, I agree with that. I just, well, uh, <clears throat> when we find out what is going to be the main sort of energies at the beginning of Pluto and Aquarius, then what is the main sort of energies at the middle of Pluto and Aquarius? So what's kind of like the beginning, the middle and the end of those energies? That yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so let me pull up two runes for the beginning. Okay. Okay, so the beginning, it's quite interesting because we have, uh, again, it just kind of uh, ties down with what the tarot card's been saying, but we have a Berkana and then we have a Naudis. So Berkana is kind of the, uh, the rune of a fertility and harvest and things being brought. Um, given, it's almost like the Empress in Tarot, very giving card. And then we have a Naudis, which is the rune of need and luck. So we basically have the end of like a life starvation, cocoon type of an energy. Uh, and we have a Burkana, which is suggesting things being brought, uh, things being harvested, things being manifested, some form of a richness that comes from fertility. Uh, I would say this also would point out to uh, finances and in general the finance situation in many countries now we have a, um, a lot of inflation and stuff like that so it seems like the beginning actually the financial situations will start to improving most likely uh, we will have less inflation uh, the, the countries will start getting richer again so first we seem to have this uh, again, it's end of some form of a negative situation and coming into a space that's more positive. That's was something that the, um, the car has been talking about as well. So we are leaving the feelings of poverty and need and we are moving more into feelings of abundance and just things getting better, which is actually really positive. But again, car has been warning about getting too positive, <laughs> happy about it. So, Okay, so let me turn to the middle section of this period. Okay. That's, again, also what the car's been talking about. So it seems like the problems are coming with the middle period uh, when of, of that, because I have uh, the seed rune and the hagalas, and hagalas um, is a uh, rune that is suggesting... Um, a hail and your harvest being destroyed <laughs> and the seed rune is suggesting something that you planted so that seems like we have a really positive start but in the middle section some of our efforts are just not coming to fruition um, or they are being this would again most likely also make sense with the wheel of fortune more in a fast and unexpected way our expectations or this specifically the seeds that we planted in the initial phase some form of plants are just not working out and they are being suddenly destroyed unexpected events something just comes and crashes them so it seems like the middle part is the one that's going to be attesting our resolution to be positive and let, let's look towards the last part and this year looks like to be a freaking roller coaster and okay, 
So we have uh, the Tyr and the Kenaz. So it seems like we are being guided towards the light at the end. So <laughs> it seems like this is going to be a one big of a roller coaster. <laughs> okay, so one last thing. Can we go back to the cards on this one? What yeah. way that the tarot thinks is the best way to manage this? So forgetting what we said, what are the kind of cards the tarot have for like this is a way to navigate and work with this? I love trying to guess what's going on by looking at your facial expressions while you pull the card. Yeah, that's like, so how's it going to be my fa my facial expression like? <laughs> yeah. Like this. Okay, no. It's, it's not quite like that, but close. Um, so, okay, long story short, all of these cards are basically saying, try not to find, fight windmills. Don't get, pick your uh, battles wisely. We have a five of wands suggesting like a battles that are a bit too equal and it's really difficult to tip the power within this struggle. Um, so the cards are suggesting don't try it. Don't fight fights that you know you can't win. Fine. Okay. That's fair enough. Uh, one more question. Oh, sorry. Is there still more to go? Yeah, there was just one more card just basically saying the same thing, seven of wands, fighting invisible enemies, fighting against the, the, the odds, fighting against something. And in this case, it's suggesting that, yeah, well, it might not be a good fight because you're fighting against something you can't win. So I would say for the important advice is, you know, pick your, pick your, pick your battles wisely and don't fight things you can't win. Okay, so two more questions. <laughs> so one question is, so if, um, how do we, how can we understand if it's a battle that we shouldn't be fighting? Is there some little key cues that are kind of signals for us to know? Because sometimes it can be difficult to know, can't it? You like, you really feel like, oh, I need to go in this direction. And that you understand there could be some resistance, but then you're like, well, is this good or bad resistance? So how can we know? if it's a good idea to continue in a certain direction of a battle, because some are good, some are bad, how should we know? Well, the guards are suggesting, well, you can tell um, based on the results that it has on your life. Um, we have, if the thing is five of coins, mm -hmm. making you lose money, mm -hmm. seven of swords, if it's stealing away your energy or resources, um, nine of swords, if it's worrying you every day and night, um, just look at, you know, check, check, um, run the numbers, look what effect the situation has on your life, yeah. step back and see what influence it has. And if you realize that the influence of the situation and the battle you're fighting, it's just negative uh, and you worry uh, and it's just stealing energy and stuff from you and, is just not going anywhere, then that's the that's the battle not to fight. So I would say that's where I believe the runes with their idea that maturity is helping you resolve problems and shields you from problems. I think this because this, it's the maturity that makes you to step back from the situation and look at it from outside and a little bit more further away perspective. You need maturity to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. So that maturity helps you to step back and look at the situation and, you know, run the numbers, see what it actually does in your life and then make decisions accordingly. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I know this so well, having Capricorn parents, it's basically, if something isn't showing you its true value or the true value it's showing you is shit, drop it. <laughs> drop it like it's hot. Don't even bother with it. It's, uh, yeah. Now, another question. Do you mind? So, uh, so that is the difficulty. So you see the opportunities. What I really, because I also think Aquarius energy is quite entrepreneurial. So what that tells me, again, there can be lots of different opportunities, but you need to almost be quite um, progressive sometimes to spot those opportunities. So for everybody that's watching, what do you, what can the cards say? Is that I have a mindset that can get you to spot opportunities? Main opportunities available. Something about the opportunities coming with this energy. 
Oh, get you smiling. <laughs> Astrid's smiling. Astrid's smiling. Well, <laughs> Astrid is not astrally vomiting. Astrid is smiling. So that's a good thing. <laughs> well, it's yeah, well, I'm smiling, and it's not that um, surprising. We have the Empress suggesting that the opportunities that are currently coming are something that you can plant the seeds for it right now and it's things that will grow in the future so when you're looking now for opportunities do not look for necessarily immediate return on your efforts with empress we are letting things grow over longer period of time empress like the berkana which is what we had in runes that's basically the same thing i was even mentioning it Empress about, is about nurturing things long term. So think long term, think what you can plant now that will grow later and that you're willing to nurture over a longer period of time. We have an Ace of Swords. Ace of Swords is about bringing new ideas, um, looking at things in new perspectives and bringing new solutions. So one of the things that you can also look for opportunities is just like this sword, cutting the Gordic knot is to look for opportunities that are coming with some form of a solutions, um, resolving the problems, coming with um, just basically a product that solves the problem. Which is if you are familiar with marketing and business, you pretty much know that's the bread and butter of it. Anyway, but the cards are just confirming it. And one of the things that's actually very interesting, yet again, talking about opportunities, is the nine of wands, which is talking about ending repeated battles uh coming up with something that just ends some form of a struggle and some form of a problem so the cards are suggesting that yes there is going to be multiple opportunities um just look for something that is sort of solving some form of a problem or a long-term struggle and be ready to nurture it long term um so yeah the cards in this particular case are not saying anything that would be completely out of alignment with the generic um you know uh business and and marketing advices for product development the cards are just kind of reiterating it in their own as uh, mystical and spiritual way and now just one thing my spirit guides are saying you must ask this it's gone off piece but it's still on topic which is um, I know that I saw something by Elon Musk saying about the fact that how have we still not got, not got any regulations in place for artificial intelligence because the amount of power coming in the future to use artificial intelligence is insane. And I 100% believe, like, agree. And my guys have really been like, this is something that's really, really important. Like the fact that we haven't actually got any regulations is something that is going to essentially grow up like warp speed and potentially is going to have a conscious or like a an intelligence far superior to any humans, but without the emotional notes that actually mean that essentially the question sometimes I think is could artificial intelligence become quite psychopathic because it's a huge intelligence and it doesn't have that same emotional context to what's going on. You know, this is something that I think is something I don't know where regulations and different things should be in place. So just what do the cards have to say about this? Because for me I feel like this but if we because Aquarius is very futuristic. So whatever is happening in 2023, I think always think far, far into the future. Because everything yeah, I agree. is about future and um, future plans. So yeah, what do the cards say about this element of artificial intelligence and how we are currently working with it? Well, technically speaking, artificial intelligence is psychopathic by design, right? Because it has the capacity to understand a human language like a human would or close to. Um, yet at the same time, it does not have emotions, which by design and by definition makes it psychopathic or at least sociopathic, at least. Um, psychopathic, well, <laughs> um, so far it hasn't done, you know. But it can also lie too, so I guess it makes it slightly psychopathic. But okay, let's have a look. Okay, so what is the development of AI, the direction where is it heading? And specifically how that's going to manifest this year, which I'm really interested about. Okay. No, I'll still you smiling. This looks good. <laughs> And now the card seems to be positive and the card seems to be pointing out. And by the way, I've done reading with a similar question privately before. 
and the cards, different cards, but been pointing out towards the same direction, which is as I was saying, are we going towards dystopia or are we going towards utopia? In both cases, the cards, just right now, actually are pointing out in the direction of utopia, which is something the CEO of Microsoft said himself. Not like I would trust them, but it <laughs> seems like what the cards are saying. So we have a 10 of cups. Hello, 10 of cups. Happy, everybody's happy, everybody's emotionally fulfilled, brings happiness um, and emotional fulfillment. Nine of coins, um, independence, suggesting so that the AI in general will get even more independent um, on humans. Um, so it's coming, it seems to be coming to the, um, to the, uh, to the realm of independence. Also, Ten of Cups means emotional fulfillment. So maybe it will be able to feel uh, emotions to some capacity, but it seems like it's bringing happiness. It's growing to be more independent on humans and king of coins brings stability, including financial stability. So I would say with this case, the, uh, the artificial intelligence and its for development can actually set a base for basically um, financial stability and abundance and wealth that's going to be created and shared. Um, worldwide, because a king of coins is uh, material wealth and stability that's not necessarily in form of, let's say, just the rich people being rich. It's more of an overarching, overarching um, idea. So it seems like it actually will potentially lead towards the growth of wealth worldwide. Which, if you think about it, for example, the Development of machine and factories that are working on machines, technically speaking, it did lead towards the growing wealth around the world and the production just kind of happening on larger scale. And technically speaking, we are now the whole the whole world is now richer than it ever was before. So it seems like it's kind of going more into that direction where the AI is becoming more independent and making us all uh, even richer in the process. Interesting thing is, however, all of these really positive cards don't even don't really transpire necessarily this year because with this year we have a seven of wands, which is card about fighting invisible enemies. So it seems like this year the the artificial intelligence might not show all of these benefits. Where is it heading yet? Which is, these might still be kind of further down in the future. And this year, we might actually, Seven of Wands, experience some form of a resistance. Uh, either this can be in a form of legislation, this can be in a form of um, Google trying to um, kill other AI projects because it's threatening its own business. Um, it can be in form of like a, either backfire, a bad press, um, or the AI does something that then just blows up, say, you know how terrible the AI is, look what it did here, what it did here. So I would say there is going to be some form of like a backlash towards the AI this year and the full, and this particular development and the full scope of the benefits of it will be more seen in years to come. Okay, that, I think that's really interesting. It's not what I would have, would, I wouldn't have guessed that. So that's actually really nice. Sounds good. <laughs> well, like currently, I think we are still in the phase which the runes and the cards had with of the excitement when we are really like excited about things. But the cards were suggesting, well, that that will sour throughout the year. So I think that maybe that is also the phase when a little bit of the backlash towards the technology and a little bit of a resistance might come after this like initial drunkness of happiness, you know, kind of evaporates and comes hangover. And also, this, I guess the whole thing is, and I do feel this stronger with AI, like we've all been talking about, if you apply maturity and responsibility to it, I mean, I think there could be great results. But again, if you're going to stay in a space of, immaturity and innocence and naivety I think again it can end up causing problems so I guess it depends which way you know different companies or whatever decide to go with it is kind of how I'd imagine and that kind of fits in with a lot of what we're talking about anyway because there will always going to be multiple different paths for people to go as there will be for different companies you know what I mean so it depends which they choose do you choose left do you choose right 
I think I think it's also going to be a lot about just going with the flow. I think I I, I have like a hint that the backlash towards the AI is going to have is going to come from, let's say, for example, people who build, who spent years and years of building their search engine optimization for Google. And let's say the, uh, the, the search engine optimization of Google and its algorithm is, for example, very heavily based on the backlinks. And the new AI is just searching things in a different way than the Google did past 20 years. So what it will naturally lead to is that the pages that have a huge organic traffic might not have organic traffic anymore, and they will see a huge dump in the organic traffic. And a lot of these people are necess- are dependent on the organic traffic. Either they have monetized blogs or they are selling some product. So I think what the AI will do is that it will render a lot of old business models useless. And that will also mean some form of artists, maybe writers, copywriters. And it will obviously open doors to new jobs and new opportunities as well. But that's where the backlash might be coming from people who are not willing to adjust to the situation and not willing to and be upset that maybe they basically are losing majority of their organic traffic or or somehow it's affecting negatively their business. So I think that's where the seven of wands, the fighting the windmills, fighting the invisible enemy uh, card can be coming. But that's just a hint. Obviously, I'm not, you know, this is not something I can predict. <laughs> But that's kind of my hint, like, at least from this particular side, I think there is going to be even more backlash once the AI really starts rolling as a search engine. Um, And I think, and I also feel apart from that, there is going to be the unexpected circumstances of the, of the, of the wheel of fortune that's going to bring potentially will lead towards even more backlash in some way. Yeah. And also I do feel with the artificial intelligence, I can think, Everything that happens in 2023, it is only the very, 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 very tiny beginning of a much, much bigger cycle. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that this is only just a very, 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 very early step in a much bigger cycle. So what it can develop incredibly different over like 20 years. And I think partly the sense is to understand that, if you know what I mean, like it's not. Yeah. It's, it's gonna, it is the seed and the seed of anything, like what you end up in the end, like a, an oak tree comes out of like an acorn. And I think this is very much where we're at, at whatever stage we're at to do with artificial intelligence and all these kind of things. So yes, I think it yeah. interesting. Let me pull a few more cards before we let's say move to channeling um, about specifically if the AI is posing any major danger in terms of like threatening livelihood or people in some major way because I guess that's one of the things that people are really afraid of. I don't think that's something that it comes early. It's not going to be the early on. What's that one? Free of, free of gaps. <laughs> I mean, of I gaps. Don't ta- they're not taking things too seriously. Uh, so the cards are basically saying, hey, you guys, with your um, doomsday ideas about AI, you need to chill out. You just need to take things easy. Am I okay? <laughs> if you say so. I think as well, 2023, again, it's so early with the ACORN. I don't think there'll be any problems this year whatsoever. And they might never be into the future either. I think, again, though, wild card energy, I think it's one of these things where you've got to constantly be assessing it as it goes along. Yeah, um, totally. It's important. But yeah, I think it is cool. But um, now what's going to say? Um, I think that's been really good. Um, thank you so much for doing all of those questions and more. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and then, yeah, I think we should definitely do some more conversations on all of this kind of stuff, any kind of ideas that you come up with. Um, stop, <laughs> wait one minute. I, okay, so what we're gonna just try and explore with now, Astrid used this amazing thing where she's found an AI that can write blogs and a whole load of other stuff. So what we're gonna do is just to do it in the whole AI Aquarius feel, is Astra's gonna ask the AI what question I need to answer with some cards. <laughs> okay, dear everybody, so. Um, I'm going to, everybody knows chat GPT at this point. Yeah, yeah, everybody been there a million times. Um, so I'm going to chat GPT. Um, what's more Aquarian than ask AI the questions we should ask the cards? 
I love the, I, I like this, it's very fusion, Aquarian fusion type of a thing. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, ChatGPT, we are doing a tarot reading for 2023. Give us five questions about the year and the new technology like AI. We could ask the cards. Okay. Ready, steady. And chat GPT. Oh, nice. It did not disappoint. So, ready? Yeah. So, the question number one for you. Yeah. What will be the greatest technological breakthrough in 2023? How many cards? Up to you. I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do some too. And then we can like compare okay okay what do you have so what was the question again what is the greatest breakthrough what will be the greatest technological breakthrough in 2023 i think this, this sounds ridiculous but i think there's going to be something to do with um eyes and i i like corrections eye surgeries something to do with that so it's something about how people's brains can also link up to their eyes in terms of if they've got damage there or there's some sort of damage going on i think something to do with that is being developed right now and it might start to come out by towards the end of the year sort of what i'm getting with that i'm having that that's very interesting i'm having queen of coins and the wheel of fortune so just saying it's going to be some new product that currently is completely unknown so it's something that the biggest breakthrough of this year is something that I have no way of even knowing that it exists right now. So that, that, that that's awfully that's awfully specific. But yeah, that's what I have. I didn't so. teach you the cards. So at, there was the sun, the nine of pentacles and the king of cups. The thing is, sometimes regardless of what they say, I just get a certain nice thing. Cool. And for me, it's just a lot of light. And I just feel like there's a lot. Of yeah. Light. And I just got the feeling like I just think there's something to do with that going on. Could it be some form of like a AI glasses stuff, virtual reality maybe stuff, like yeah. something that makes you like see. Maybe it's something like a glasses that can like make you see reality and AI virtual reality at the same time. Like I agree, you know, like Star Trek glasses or some sort. I think it's um, about independence as well, though, which is why I think it's to do with people that can't necessarily see very well. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I think I, I think it's going to be something that at this point, like some form of a technology that somebody is just like sitting on, like a toad on a stream, and they said nothing about it, and nobody knows about it, and they're just going to release it. So that's why. I, okay. That? Question number two. Yeah. What potential challenges will AI bring to society in 2023? Good. That's a good question. <laughs> Challenges. Okay, what potential challenges will AI bring to society in 2023? <laughs> okay. You go first this time. <laughs> I just, I got five of wands, which is something I already, you know, was having when I asked about the potential challenges and injuries, resistance, fighting it. Um, uh, fighting the, you know, the resistance, fighting the invisible males, uh, fighting the, uh, of, of the, the battles that are, you just can't win. So yeah. Uh, but potential challenges is that people will try to fight it. Fair enough. I've got the King of Swords, Seven of Swords and Three of Pentacles. I definitely do think it's, um, I see what you're saying about, I think it's going to be, I think this is more specifically about how it's going to be for. I just think the thing is, people aren't going to be able to get their heads around that they can work as a team with the sort of AI stuff that's being developed in whatever way it is. It's going to, like you say, people are going to feel like it's almost like a competition with it rather than going mm. into a space of feeling that it can um, it can provide help provide so much more for our society. But then I'm also getting the other thing as well, that I do think there's going to be a lot of confusion about how to work with it successfully. So I think even people that are actually trying to do it and trying to do it in the right way, I think there's some things that are going to be going on in companies where they realize they're coming against snags 
and they don't quite understand how to sort out that snag. So I think there'll be some delays in stuff that was they going to be launched in 2023 and it's going to take a little bit longer because they get into a spate of confusion with something to do with it and it's about having to kind of like uh, just reprogram a certain type of thing about how it can work a little bit better before it's being released. So that's one of the things I see. Nice. Okay. Question number three. Yeah. How will new technology enhance the lives of people in 2023? <laughs> okay. Tell me how you're going to enhance my life. <laughs> Oh my God, I feel like I'm talking to the head of Microsoft. Okay. <laughs> By the way, the guy scares the, you know, the fuck out of me. But that's another thing. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah you go first. You I'm focused now because you've made me laugh. So sorry, the question is, how is it going to enhance? Um, how will new technology enhance the lives of people in 2023? All right, okay. Ah, oh, I get good cards. What do you get? I got Emperor, which is suggesting that it will help them to take a bigger control over their life and take a control over things without them actively participating. Because the Emperor is about when you're Emperor of something, you are in control of it, but you're not necessarily the one who got those, goes and does every single little stuff. You're just Emperor, so you're in control of the things simply by your uh, by your occupation or by your state of being. So in this case, it's suggesting that it will help people to take a, a larger scope of control over their life um, and uh, over the parts that previously they might need to like go and do stuff. So now it's the control over things is more um, remote. Clean of coins is going to start a lot of new projects, is going to uh, start a lot of new chapters, a lot of new companies, a lot of new projects. So Queen of Coins is somebody who is starting new projects, somebody who is entrepreneurial. So it seems like it's opening doors to new technological uh, and devious and entrepreneurial companies and projects. And Page of Wands, Page of Wands is suggesting quite a fast progress in things. So I would say it is going to help to speed up a lot of the projects that people are currently working on. Yeah, that makes sense. Interesting. Did you say you got Queen of Pentacles? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I got Queen of Pentacles as well. So that's come out twice, which is interesting. Then I also got Queen of Swords, and I love this one. I got Ace of Pentacles. So I think the way that it's going to do it is what I actually got is with these two Queen energies, I feel like there's definitely going to be some products coming out in 2023, which actually help tasks at home get done easier. So I kind of like what you were saying, but specifically it feels like it's stuff that I feel like that's maybe one of the main ways that stuff might first of all come in, which is a little bit different. I guess a bit like Siri or Siri or, you know, she's mainly she came into the homes, didn't she? Is something that you just say a task and then she puts them on the Internet or songs. I think I've never used it, but um, I think it's going to be it's stuff like that. But I see it more as in. I don't know, you know, like maybe washing machines could have been seen back in the day as like a, not an AI thing, but you know what I mean, They're a new machine yeah. and it suddenly makes tasks a lot easier. I see it like things like that, particularly in the home. But also what I do see is like, um, it's kind of like, it's going to give people a lot of hope that basically things can be better somehow. I don't know how, but again, this might come into the beginning bit of this whole enthusiasm in the very beginning, but it feels quite a soft energy to begin with this year. It feels like it's very, very hopeful and it's kind of nurturing because this is what I feel from these cards, basically. Yeah. It seems like they are talking about the same things, like uh, new opportunities, control, new new technologies, new things opening up, people learning how to deal with it. Um, yeah, that, that's very interesting. Well, the fourth question is what opportunities will be created, but we kind of already uh, asked that previously. And the last question is, the fifth one is quite interesting. It is, how can we best use AI to benefit humanity in 2023? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. This is really fun, like asking the AI to ask a question. You can ask Tarot. It's very... <laughs> Hyper Aquarian fusion. <laughs> okay, so how can we benefit from AI the most? Well, it's yeah, well, well, yeah. 
the free of coins the again that's coming up loads yeah like how can you best benefit how it can be best benefit from ai free of coins you just learn how to do you just learn how to use it the and then two of coins using it for multitasking and two of coins about um dealing with multiple things at once so it's basically helping you to um, remove your workload and focus on the things that are really important for you rather than uh, juggling a smaller task and being overwhelmed by them so how you can for you how you can use it what you can do with it to benefit the most learn how to use it and learn how to delegate less important tasks to it yeah and to be fair i really don't get much different page of swords the lovers and the yeah. eight of pentacles like i really just think on a just like a really basically just everybody has a way that they can apply it to either their daily life or their job which will actually help them create something more Even just you delegate tasks to it that's the that's the, the your work yeah, the, um, delegate your work tasks to it. Um, let it bring you new ideas. So, yeah, not very, not very surprising answer um, to that. Pretty much what also the the CEO of Microsoft and other articles said. The cards are just confirming it that that really what it is. Yeah. Um, fascinating. This year, in 2023, in 2023, that's what it is. I just want to clarify in 2023 because <laughs> I think it's something we need to just assess almost every single year to see and well actually as it starts growing even quicker than that um I really feel this really strongly and then it will all be awesome but not if we I just think you have to be I really feel like it, you've got to be so responsible with this as in the way it's developed and the way it's going to go ahead and that what happens in the beginning is never what happens in the end and I don't mean that in a good or a bad way I just mean come on uh, acorn to an oak tree it's kind of like you know so but yeah I really think it can be super powerful and I know I'm going to use it for blogs <laughs> like what you said <laughs> wait what if we could get um, um yeah um I, I use AI and AI work to I do my do first videos for us this would be amazing I would totally be up for that I'd be like cool let's get the AI to look like me and then I'll tell the AI what to say is it like you know artificially on the computer because you see this kind of thing a lot already don't you so then Astrid we wouldn't even be doing this could have your AI and my AI <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure my AI could never be as witty <laughs> yeah. I tell you what I was just thinking no I no AI could be as cute as Rupert and um, and also AI is terrible with humor. Right? Like it doesn't go, it doesn't do well with jokes. Like if you ask it to like write a joke or stand up comedy script and, and you're just trying to be funny, it's not, it's horrendous. It's just, so I think there's definitely still a place for humans and uh, at least, <laughs> at least in some way, um, because yeah, AI is not very funny. Yeah. Oh, and sorry, just one last thing just before we like uh, obviously finish. I think the other thing that comes in with um, AI, I do think it is also, um, or not AI, sorry, but it's, I suppose it's a form of AI, or not really, no, but um, is um, with this Aquarius energy is, is alien stuff. For sure, for me, Aquarius energy has that kind of thing. And obviously, I do think it'll be interesting to see how or what develops with anything to do with that in the future. Um, because in a way, I think artificial intelligence, depending how it develops, it, it will be a form of another species that's alien to human. And therefore, that also classifies it as an alien to some extent if it develops these things. And not that that's a problem either which way, but I guess it'll be interesting to see how we all kind of integrate. Because if we're looking for equality within our own race and species and all the rest of it, then I wonder how we would look at equality in the future to do with like uh, AI and everything that that represents in that way. I'll be curious. There is, um, I'm not sure if you've read the book, but um, there is a book that pretty much describes all of that uh, perfectly, according to myself, without ever mentioning the word alien. And that is 2001 Space Odyssey. <laughs> it's, I really, really recommend it. The, the actually funny thing is that there is always a, there's also a movie, but the movie does not have the ending. If you want to read the ending, you need to read the book. It was one of the reasons by actually one of the very few times in history where book and a film was released on the same day, not one preceding the other. 
but in 2001 space odyssey i don't want to spoil it but it does explain the interaction between human and aliens even though it never says the word alien in the whole book and it kind of suggests how the development is influenced one by the other and how what that means in humanity in the long run um it's 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 very nicely described there without it ever being described there and it's i think it's it's my favorite sci-fi book i'm not really a big sci-fi girl but yeah i i think it's all these answers to that i'm always finding in that book so Ooh. recommend 2001 space odyssey the book yeah because the film for the first 10 minutes <laughs> yeah well the thing is that the, the the movie does not explain anything it's pretty much just a, an illustration for the book that's the thing. They've been both released on the same day, and the idea is that you can't understand the movie without reading the book because he doesn't understand. He doesn't explain a couple of very very vital points in the movie that you need to know so you understand, especially the ending, because you won't understand the ending if you don't read the book. And he describes what's actually happening to him and why, and also describes what the obelisk is and why. So yeah, you pretty much have to read the book to understand the movie. But yeah, it's it's very well described. And well, well, I'll read, well, I might try and read the book. <laughs> the book is great. The book is uh, I'm I like Kubrick. Um, even though Space 2001 Space Odyssey, it's not my favorite movie from him. Uh, but the book is really good. Excellent. Basically, so now what we thought we'd do is uh, it's a really acquiring thing, and this is my inspiration. I bet loads of you will know this. Napoleon Hill. It's amazing. And what I love about it so much, it was written, it must have been like the 1920s. Think how long ago this is, like so long ago. And basically there's a chapter all about the sixth sense. And if I remember it correctly, it does this amazing thing, which is basically channeling, where basically <clears throat> what you can do is, if you have a problem that you want to solve, um, you can basically in meditation or however you want to do it you can call in very specific people that might that can be dead or that maybe aren't even dead just call in their consciousness and then basically have them around like in a board meeting and then don't force anything but they allow a natural conversation to go off between all of them and then you're just the observer or you can even indeed ask questions i'm telling you i'm not even making this up it's in the book think and grow rich it's like, uh, this is a super, this is all about money. It's super Capricorn. It's super practical. There is nothing wishy-washy about this book. And he also um, did like interviews to get this content from all the most successful like millionaires and stuff in the time. So it's super, super Capricorn, but with like this Aquarius Uranian twist right towards the end to do with your sixth sense. So essentially really what this is talking about to some extent is channeling. So what we thought we'd do now is Astrid asked the AI to give us a name that we should channel, and we got, who was it? I'm going to pull the, the picture of him, uh, but I let you to say the name because it's a British name, and I think a British person will give it a better justice to pronounce it. Person that's dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the next one, um, uh, British dyslexic is still more than like a non-British speaker. So. Basically, the AI said we should channel Alan Turing. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so um, and I'm sorry, Astrid, you say what was the main thing that he did, or the thing that he was well known for? Yeah, I have my cheat sheet. So Alan Turing was a British mathematician and crypto analyst. He died in 1954, and I, I think he, as a result of that, makes a perfect person to channel about the technological science and the development of 2023. He was the father of computer science. Um, he is the uh, inventor behind the famous Enigma machine who helped uh, that helped uh, break uh, a German army codes during the Second World War, and he also created the turning test. Um, he is considered to be the uh, father of a current computer science and obviously any um, technological development and its effect on humanity were things that he was writing about and he was interested in. As I said, he was mathematician and crypto analyst. So he is the one that AI, AI itself 
recommended that we should do for channeling? Okay, so also, I'm not going to lie, but I'm just going to be honest, I find this a bit intimidating because it feels like stagey and I've never done it in this way before. Usually when I channel, I'm super chill, super relaxed, and it just comes through without even trying. So what my guys have just said, Astrid, to help me in this very moment is ask me questions and then I'll ask them through here because then at least I've got like a, like it's like, um, then it can get me out of my conscious mind, if that makes sense. Okay. So I see it as if I'm just going to ask him and he's going to tell me. So it's sort of like a, it's more like this way of channeling it, basically. Yeah. Cool. Um, so um, during the time of uh, being a cryptographer and working on Enigma machine, which is obviously working with codes and mathematics, did even this idea of the machine being independent and having artificial intelligence and being able to process the information independently did it even cross anybody's mind at that point? Absolutely not, no. Although I always knew that it would be able to do so much more than what we could ever understand, but I had no idea what I ever think it would develop in that kind of way. But also at the time, so much was going off that the scope for imagination in that type of way wasn't present because we were so engaged in having to do some real, real-time response to something that was going off in life. So it made it all very pressurized to get a very specific result done. So there wasn't that same scope that the mind went off into those kind of tangents, other than the tangents to solve the very problem to do with what we were doing with machines and stuff like that at the time. During the Second World War and slightly after it, it was one of the first moments in a human history when people been really able to see the both creative and destructive power of modern technology. How did people at the time perceive it? Did they see the future after the Second World War, technology being thing that will help them build a new society, or they saw it more as a destructive force? So I'm going to interject with bits that I'm also getting the side thing. The thing is, this person is incredibly, incredibly compassionate, insanely compassionate. And even though that they had this like um, really far advanced mind, so much of where their soul was at was from a place of compassion. So a lot of these questions, he's more seeing it and he's telling me he's feeling it more from like how the people were. And like he's saying at that time, people weren't even thinking about anything to do with that because they'd just gone through so much that so many of the things were kind of like relevant and that's where their focus was. So even the thought about things being destructive, he's saying it's like when you've been through something really traumatic and then it's passed, it's almost like sometimes you almost forget it a little bit because it almost was so traumatic. And then you want to just, you're forgetting the pain because you want to enjoy the fact that you're with your family or you're now free or whatever it is. And he says, this is the thing where we're at now, we're in a kind of really privileged place to basically um, have huge developments with any type of intellectual pursuits because that there is um, there's the scope for it and there's the space for it in the way that there never was back then and like he is saying like stuff like with that 2020 period again such an incubation period is basically what so many people like even himself does when he's finding solutions to stuff and so so much um, can germinate that word that you said so much can germinate in that space um, so yeah that's what he's just saying, that people weren't really thinking in that way at all because they were so focused in another way after so much trauma. Um, because obviously um, you worked um, in army and uh, combined computer science, obviously with the development of a um, code breaking machine. Um, where do you see the modern technology? Where do you think we can go in a terms of modern warfare? How is it? Go how do you think it might influence it in or change it? In terms of modern warfare. He says he thinks it's going to become um, even more hidden uh, than what was going on when he was doing stuff. It's, it'll be like a whole mm -hmm. level of like, there'll almost be like split worlds between those that understand exactly what's going on with that and are involved with it and those that are not and so many things will be avoided or just not happen through stuff where uh, because there's literally just split worlds going off with it and so there might be things that could appear to be really traumatic or really good but then they just never quite happen but most of us would never even know that that was even going on in the background because he said in some ways that's what he experienced 
but now it's going to be to a whole other level of that. And back when it was going on with him, it was such a small few, whereas this is going to be massive. It's going to be like a huge percentage of people because they'll be involved in it in some way or other, because he does think that the thing that's different now is um, <clears throat> because of all the advancements, there's also so many different components involved, not just within the, the uh, machinery or the gear themselves, but also with the different minds coming together and then with the different like people agreeing to stuff and signing contracts. And it is beyond complicated and complex compared to what he experienced. And back then he thought he was experiencing a lot, but this is like a hundred and tenfold, um, that's what I'm saying. If we consider um, artificial intelligence as basically being a program that works basically partially on mathematics as a language processing program, as a mathematician, does he think that it's possible that this program could uh, potentially develop its own consciousness purely based on the fact that it's processing such a large amount of information at once? He says, he says he's split on this one really, because for him, and I think this is this real soul place and this humanity place that he comes with, you know, this compassionate place, part of his soul doesn't really feel that any machine could ever get to that sort of awareness because it's something to do with being human and that's how he experiences in that way. But then when he comes out of that rational mind, he is also aware that, wait, let me just get the word exactly. He's also just aware, and this is the example that is given, is given the awareness that, you know, at one point, nobody would believe anything like a car could exist, and then it existed. And now how much has developed in that kind of way and how advanced cars have now got and things like that. And so he says in the same way, and this is the beauty of technology, it's just going to expand with the imagination of humanity and it will go in that direction. So it can go, <laughs> it's unlimited because really it's still being created through the consciousness of humans. But then as it can develop and do its own thing, he personally still finds that a hard concept to get his head around that it could actually go to that place but then again he is saying look it is it's very different worlds and it's very different ways of seeing things but if they could do what they did back then he believes that right now absolutely anything really could happen with it because they never thought that it could happen in the way that it did when they did it but it happened and so because of that it has, gives him this kind of thing of um understanding the unlimitedness of it. If he could have, if he could have a research, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, sorry if you're tired. I was just having one last question. Yeah. If he could have a research right now, what would be the thing that he would like to do research on? <laughs> I don't know what, uh, he's saying global warming. He's saying he'd put a lot of his like he would want to be really developing into that and things to do with that and to do be working with that. But that makes a lot of sense, given the fact that he done the the Enigma machine, which was basically like he seems to be really interested uh, on like a large global problems and trying to like find solutions to them. That was basically what he did with the Enigma machine. So it makes sense that he would be interested in something like that. Yeah, because the thing is, again, what what it really feel particularly from this guy, and then I think this is quite interesting because I think he must be quite, he must have been quite Aquarius Iranian to be able to do what he did with mathematics, right? And then there's this whole kind of thing about, but with Aquarian that sort of energy, will you lose the humanity touch? You know, really, will we go to a place of no feeling and this, that, and the other? But all I can feel from him is feelings. And even all he's really interested in is the humanity side of stuff. Really, that's all it really was. It's just that his tool was that he used maths and he used things in that kind of way. And so I guess, and this is now coming out of that, but then into what we were saying, I guess this will be really interesting. It will it will all depend, I guess, on some level, the people that are developing it, like, are they really, do they really have this pure space of wanting to really do something that's going to help humanity? Or do they have different types of agendas? Because I can just feel that his agenda, agenda is 100% humanity on every level. It's almost so interesting. 
him to get the answers out about the science or stuff like that because he's not actually interested which sounds bizarre he was just more interested in the fact that it could do what it could do to help and that's overriding it does sound like a pisces it would be very interesting to uh check his uh birth chart um he seemed to have yeah he very really does have this piscean vibe i would say there is pisces somewhere in his chart uh quite strongly present yeah and then i'm definitely getting that very like a uh, soft caring vibes from him as well which is very interesting because people are mathematicians and very into uh as well i think einstein i think he, he was a pisces as well i think oh okay interesting um, so yeah it is really interesting really interesting Mm. It's not what I thought, if you know what I mean. And yeah, it seems a very compassionate person, which is not something I would necessarily expect from a mathematician. Um, they tend to be a little bit more rational minded, a little bit more cut up from their emotions because they spent spent a lot of their time in that mental space and that you know on that mental plane. Um, emotions are obviously more astral, so um, sometimes they underdevelop the astral, so they can overdevelop the mental, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, interesting, unexpected. Yeah, yeah. and I also just wonder, just generally then, like, you know, again, just going back to this Aquarius thing about, will there be a thing, like, maybe artificial intelligence then, who knows, maybe in the future it will just naturally, with also a huge amount of intelligence, and this is just coming from the feeling of here, with a huge amount of intelligence, but maybe it naturally just would want to also be there to really be supportive to humanity, you know what I mean? Because yeah, it makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Pass on the on the planet compared to all of the geniuses that develop something which helps humanity. Like, which way does it go? You know, which way is higher? And I guess if we create artificial intelligence, so in some ways it mirrors our consciousness and it creates its AI consciousness. Its AI consciousness might mirror humanity's consciousness, and it might set itself up in a similar sort of way. With like, well, that percentage of AI might be more malefic, but then that huge, bigger part of AI might actually more be more Benefit, you know, like a benefit, whatever you would say, because it's yeah, totally. No, it would reflect. Totally. And also, like one of the things that it's often um, described in occultism, and that is basically, if you're looking for something that is divine, you're looking for something that is universal, and you're looking for it for looking the same things for a subjective that all the subjective individual parts have in common, hence that it's universal, hence that it's divine, the more universal it is, the more divine it is, hence, for example, things like yin and yang, it's black and white, good and evil, this polarity, the polarity itself is a very simple concept that is eternal, untouched, and very universal, hence it's very close to divine, but obviously all the sets of individualities are slightly further away from that, still part of that, but slightly away from that. That's the idea of occultism and its understanding of divinity. So if, if I apply that to AI, obviously what AI is doing is exactly it's looking for the uni universal as a result of analyzing all the separate individualistic parts and looking for something that they have in common. Technically speaking, that makes, from an occult perspective and theoretically speaking, in a roundabout way, that makes AI literally dogs at machina, literally a god in like a machine machine god um i'm really interested where this is going to go because technically speaking from theoretically occultist perspective this is what it is simply by the way how it's working and uh that's why i'm finding it very very interesting and i think as it will develop it will have that's just a wild card guess but my guess is that the more the um the more it will get developed eventually it will gain the ability to predict future like cards like tarot cards do but i think that's still a while in the future yeah but also the other thing is as well with predicting the future anyway is quite often if people's patterns of behavior don't change and most people's don't to the level, it becomes very easy to start predicting stuff that's true so if people would not be so predictable, it would be much difficult to predict future. <laughs> <laughs> you just never know, right? Mm. The best thing is that just anybody can be a wild card at any moment. And uh, wait, you know, just this one last thing, just one last thing, just one last thing. 
Let's both pull a card, a wild card. What's the, just a wild card that they interpret. We don't even pull the wild card. Oh, what? by the way, my spider say hello. Oh. <laughs> Thinking about wild cards. <laughs> she finally, she finally, one of my spiders, one of them, she finally came out. So let's have a look. <laughs> Not sure much you can, much you can see her, but yeah. Yeah, you can. Persephone says hi. Oh, oh wait, closer. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi, Persephone. Hey, look, she's moving. She's looking at you. She's saying hi. Hi. <laughs> she's still a baby, but yeah, she's okay. Oh. Suddenly, this oh. video has gone into when you read for me. <laughs> okay, so one last wild card. They can just interpret. We don't say anything. Yeah. So let us look at the wild card. What is it? Oh, I can't see stuff. What is it? <laughs> oh, nine of swords. Oh, come on. <laughs> Where you pull one, you pull one. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, oh, you know what? I'm actually going to use for the wild card since it's wild card. I'm going to use that crazy, like crazy mysterious kingdom of bird spirit tarot. My, my my absolutely because for those who know I like to correct rare and bizarre stuff including rare and bizarre hobbies um and one of the things I have is a collection of weird divination methods and I have as a part of it I have mysterious kingdom bird spirit tarot um as a really bizarre Chinese tarot card deck with birds go figure uh, the most perfect interpretation of fate, the most exquisite tarot patterns. Um, so let me pull you some most exquisite tarot patterns. <laughs> it's it's a really bizarre deck. It, it's for the really bizarre birds. In case you're into that. Um, okay, so wild card from bizarre Chinese tarot deck. Oh, um, I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> I think it's Seven of Cups. Nice. Okay, so we've got nine of swords and seven of cups. Yeah, that's not very positive, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess it's it's trying to um, warn us not to fall for pitfalls of spiritual um, development, of worrying too much and being distracted by too many different options. And it's probably our spirit teams both saying, just get off the video now, you've done enough. <laughs> I'm putting the tarot cards back into my box. <laughs> okay, so basically, thank you so much, Astrid. It's been amazing just chatting to you. It's cool always. So thanks so much for that. <laughs> Thanks for always making me laugh. I love it. The humor's great. And then we'll do something soon. Yeah, sure. Um, this was awesome. This was joy. Um, yeah, I'm hoping whoever's watching that had a good time with us too. And we'll see you next time. And also, if you're still there, um, I'll leave all Astrid this stuff below. She's got loads of courses. I always go to, she's my go-to tarot reader. I mean, I can't recommend enough. So all the links I'll put there below.